gives us an opportunity to listen to what owner representatives and tenant representatives uh, have to say about our uh, rent guidelines that we are charged with uh, determining for the uh, leases that expire this September 30th and commence uh, October 1st or any time during uh, that year. Uh, let me <coughs> ask the board members to introduce themselves, starting on my far left. Eddie Mae Barnes, public member. Osa Rubin, public member. Sorry, everybody has to speak up because apparently this is the only microphone, so. Did you hear me? No. <coughs> yes. Did you repeat yes. it? Yes. They want you to repeat it. Elsa Rubin, public member. Ken Finger, owner rep. Joseph Whelan, public member. Genevieve Roach, tenant member. Carol Cope, owner member. Uh, and I'm Jane Morgenstern, public member and chair. Uh, we also have uh, with us April Gray Huertas, our council, and uh, Chuck Lesnick, who is uh, the new division uh, Deputy Council of the Division. Uh, I guess you, on the other side. most of you on know the other that side, Michael, the on the other uh, side. Sorry. Michael Rosenblatt retired last year, so we're lucky to have April as our council, and we're lucky to have Chuck, who I'd like to uh, have say a few words. Also, Howard Breschen, uh, many of you have seen before, uh, our stalwart uh, court reporter. Thank you, Jane. We're lucky to have Jane in the board, too, because uh, this is an almost volunteer effort that they go through every year uh, so that we can get the numbers right. This is the third of three hearings, and we've had already over 100 people come to the first two, and it looks like we have over 30 people here so far tonight. Uh, not all the 100 people that have come have spoken, uh, but many of the um, spokesmen have eloquently uh, put forth the positions of both the tenants and the landowners and the public. Uh, and it's an important part of the process and a criteria by which the board will use as they uh, evaluate and try to come to some decisions in a very open, transparent process which will continue on next week and the week after until it is finally voted upon. So thank you for taking time out of your evening and let the, uh, the show begin. Oh, uh, the timing on this, because we have so many people, uh, three minutes. Um, if you represent an organization, five minutes. I will have a uh, time thing. I don't have a whistle or a bell or anything like that. Uh, but if I do indicate, just wrap things up. And I think this is the only place that they speak from, right? So you get to come right up here to speak. Um, yes. yes. Yeah, unless we can move this no, we're down. Yeah. But no, down. No. Okay. Good. They'll walk up. Uh, okay. The first uh, person on the list is uh, Jeff Foster. It's an owner, uh, there, there are steps on either side, owners. or you can take the large step here. Okay, thank you. Good evening. Oh, uh, yeah, handouts. Thank you. You know, I forgot to <coughs> mention that um, <coughs> handouts actually. Aside from Jeff, who's already down there at the end, when, if you just hand them to April, she can hand them to the, the rest of the board. If you can. Yeah, yes, yeah. Thank you. There should be one right You have another <laughs> Thank you. Here you go. I am too. I don't know what's going on inside. I'm getting inordinately crazy. No, I think I have more than one. Sorry. Everybody have one answer? Yes. Oh. Uh, good evening. My name is Jeff Foster. I'm with Castle Oil Company. 
Um, should I address the board, or how would you like me to? I'm going to address the board, but don't stand with your back to the okay. audience. Okay. Right, How's that? Okay. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm here just to give some facts on on the energy costs this past year and the uh, how cold this winter has been. So I will be very short. If we compare this winter to last winter uh, and the costs of heating oil, it was almost identical. You, you, you couldn't, uh, it would be, the, the folks who are looking at a chart uh, will see that it's almost identical, very close, except for at the end of the winter where this, this heating season uh, was, was um, a little, somewhat more expensive. The only change, um, and, it's a, and it's a dramatic change, is in the severity of the winter. And um, a coldness in, in a winter time is measured in degree days. It's a mathematical way to do it. Uh, it's very boring, so I'm not going to bother you with all the details, but it's measured in, in the numbers. And for the board who has the numbers, um, if you would look at the degree day log, yeah. um, the higher the number, the colder the month. And the, the bottom line is that if you were to compare the winter of 2013 versus 2014, notice it, it starts in April and it ends in March. It's not a calendar year. The, this particular winter was 14.6% colder than the prior winter which means that you burned at least 14.6% more fuel. Uh, in fact, it's more than that because the colder it gets, the percentage of fuel to keep an apartment at 68 degrees increases more. So costs were relatively similar, but the volume of oil burned was at least 14.6% more. And it's just a simple fact. I don't have a great deal more to, to add than that. Then you burn a lot more fuel. So then they're not compatible, is what you're telling me. You, 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 I think you brought, opened up by saying there wasn't much difference. In the cost per gallon. If you go, if you okay. go to the chart, okay. the cost per gallon was quite similar. Okay. All right. All right. However, you burned this heating season, this past winter, versus the prior winter, 14.6% okay. more fuel, so at the, least. So the cost was higher. It has to be. The cost to the building owner was higher to heat the buildings this year by about 14%, only because of volume. Okay. Uh, board members, I have yeah. a question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what's the? I don't see any. <coughs> what the source of this is, and what area this is covering? Okay, um, I could have given you. This is. What I did was I took. Uh, and I don't mean this to be a, an advertisement for Castle, but Castle is a large fuel oil distributor in the New York metropolitan area and has been for about 85 years. I took. Um, and I've been making this presentation for years, I took the same data of mm -hmm. average pricing for uh, tanks that were about 5,000 gallons, people who paid their bills in 30 days. And so I you're took speaking of your, your, only your customers. This is that, based on that, your customers. That is correct. Thank you. Now, pricing would be higher if someone had a 1,000 gallon tank or if they didn't pay their bills in 30 days. So I just took, and I've been using the same information. I haven't, I haven't varied that in, in years right. yeah. that I've been doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jerry Houlihan. <coughs> I, I neglected to say earlier that well, the speakers just, when they're finished speaking, don't rush off the stage because uh, they, there may be some questions or comments from the board members.
Jerry Houlihan of Houlihan Barnes Realtors, and I'm the AOAC's Vice Chairman. Uh, my company owns approximately 200 ETPA apartments in Westchester County. We also arrange mortgage financing and also provide investment sales services for the apartment owners of the county. Tonight I'm here to speak about the real estate taxes. Real estate taxes are the largest expense out of the 10 expense items shown in your DHCR operation and maintenance surveys. Real estate taxes make up over 18% of the total operating expenses of the apartment building. The expenses in, this expense has increased 1.5% over the last year and is the only expense that never decreases unless there's a tax grievance filed by the owner. And in that case, it doesn't appear in your survey as an expense item, it appears as income. The material I just handed out shows the real property tax rates and their annual increases in the cities with the highest concentration of ETPA apartments. New Rochelle has a 3.7% increase in taxes, White Plains a 2.8%, Yonkers a 2.7%, and Mount Vernon a 2.9%. From 2002 to 2013, real estate taxes increased almost three times the rate of the rent guideline increases, three times. To simplify this, if you use the DHCR surveys, an owner would need to collect an average of $188 per month per apartment in rent to pay property taxes alone. To expand on this, an owner would have to collect a minimum of $1,025 in rent to operate his or her building without a loss and before any in capital improvements. The average ETPA building is nearly 100 years old so capital improvements are a necessity. If the average cost to operate an apartment is $1,025 per month, how can you justify collecting anything less? If someone has been in the apartment for 20 years and pays $600 a month, is it justifiable for a landlord to come out of his pocket $425 every month, more than $5,000 per year, over $100,000 over 20 years to keep the tenant in possession? Is it justifiable to have someone who has moved in recently to pay much more for the same size apartment? Of course not. ETPA is an antiquated system and its purpose exists no more. A free market is healthy and economically balanced, but since we're obliged to this law, the rent board must pass a separate guideline for those rents substantially below the cost of operating the apartment. Please consider this and the ever-increasing property taxes that landlords pay along with the other nine expense items on the surveys when deliberating the rent guidelines increases this year. If you openly and honestly consider all the expense information, you simply must pay or pass a fair rent guideline increase. Thank you. Thank you. Board members, Any Jerry, these caps that you're giving as far as the um, New Rochelle Tax increase 3.7. Is that considering the 2% cap that's supposed to exist? Or is that above it? Or is that 1.7 over the 2% cap that's supposed to be on the property taxes? Well, these are the actual numbers in the cities. I don't know how that equation works into the 2% property tax cap that the state has. Okay. I, I, I don't have an answer. Sorry. Okay. Joe? Okay, let me refer you to... Let's see, the last paragraph, the uh, sentence just before it. The rent board must pass a separate guideline for those rents substantially below the cost of operating it. Okay. So I take the point, but do we see an elaboration of that idea? Yeah. Some examples, some what ifs, mm -hmm. some alternatives, you know what I mean? Yeah, and our chairman will address that in his uh, presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jerry. 
I'm going to go out of order a little bit in order to try. We have more um, owner representatives uh, who signed our sheets than uh, tenants, so I'll go out of order a little bit. I'm going to call somebody. I don't know what he is, but after this uh, person, I will call a tenant representative. Uh, next on the list is Jim Lunfranke. Jim Lunfranke? Yes. You can have it. What was the name? He'll tell us. And while uh, Mr. Lunfranke is coming up, let me uh, recognize Emma Jean Lofton Woods, who joined us uh, a while ago. Uh, a little while ago. Tenant uh, member of the board. Madam Chairwoman, uh, distinguished members of the board, um, my name is Jim Lanfranchi, and I am neither a tenant, neither a tenant of anywhere, um, never have been, um, not landlord, never owned any rental real estate at all, ever. Yeah. You might think that I have no vested interest in being here. And, um, but actually I do. We have a law that, by its nature, um, artificially reduces the value of a building, the value of the people to my left, to your right. It, 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 it reduces the value, the assessed value of, the, of their real estate. By doing so, it reduces the taxes that they have to pay. So I'm not here representing either side. I'm representing myself, the tens of thousands, the majority of this county of all the people who are single family own homeowners, two to four family homeowners, cooperative shareholders, and condominium owners who do not benefit at all from ETPA or from the reduced valuations that they get. Because that's what happens. You reduce somebody's taxes, they pay less. They, you reduce their assessed value, they pay less taxes. That's what's happening to me and to the vast majority. All the taxes that they're not paying are made up by me and the people that I'm here representing. Unfortunately, most of the people I represent apparently are Ranger fans because uh, mm -hmm. otherwise they would be sitting here as well. Um, one of the things I thought was interesting is it's, I, I was looking at a t-shirt that said America. That was America, live, uh, dream. dream. I, I recently found out through my son's hard work that my family came on the Mayflower. They had no idea. No idea. They came here for a reason. They came here to... Uh, for freedom. To avoid tyranny. Then they fought and died in revolution and civil war for one reason, taxation without representation. Well, this, this social program, which one of our, which Jerry, you know, rightly pointed out, was enacted at a time that we needed, we needed that. We needed the fact that, you know, runaway inflation could raise rates, could raise rents at a faster rate than inflation. It was also at a time when there was gas rationing. You needed coupons to get sugar. I mean, my parents told me about it. This was all, you know, this was, and then, and then it became, took on a life of its own, right? ETPA took on a life of its own. It became political pork, right? For every 40 unit or 20 unit building, there's one owner and there's 80 registered voters. What, what politician, I couldn't find a Republican politician who would talk to me and say that they wouldn't support repeal of ETPA. Three minutes. So We're almost up? Okay, I'm going to wind it up. What I'm saying is, this is a law that doesn't affect just tenants and landlords. It affects, it affects everybody. It affects all homeowners, all residents of the county, whether they benefit 
from a tax from a rent reduction, or they benefit from the fact that they have a reduced tax basis. Doesn't benefit me at all. I'm paying the cost of it. I know that the words mean, means testing is a very bad phrase. Wrap it up. Okay. Please. Nobody wants means testing, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask for means testing of a very limited basis. I don't want to see your tax return, but every time you renew your lease, I'd like you to sign a statement that you don't own rental real estate and that you don't own a, own a vacation property. That's kind of reasonable, right? Because I, I don't own either. Frankie, please. Thank you. I'm, I'm done. Thank you very much for your time. Well, let's By the see way, if anybody you, has any yeah. questions who, who for you. Who are the public res representatives? We. Yeah, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm one of the public. Yes, you, you okay. did say that. All right, you made a point about taxes mm -hmm. and um, condominium co-ops. Are you aware that some of those owners do get STAR? I think it's oh, still oh, in effect. Almost everybody gets STAR. <laughs> right. As long, so, as, they, so, as, long so, as they hold the property, they don't hold the property out for, for rent, right? Uh, well, in my building, they're subleasing. Next point. Well, um, if they're subleasing, they don't qualify. Yeah, well, it's got to be for a private residence. Well, it's got to be for. You have to occupy them. There are exceptions the, for everything. No, there, there, there aren't. There the other, aren't. the other no. question. The the other enhanced, enhanced star is for veterans and for the retired. retired. But if if you know of somebody, if you know of somebody who's renting out a property, and claiming a star exemption. That they don't qualify for that. That's not on my conscience. That's on theirs. The other, the other point well, you it made. Be on your conscience. The other point you made. The you. other point you made was about a social program. Since when does ETPA fall under social? And by the way, you said your family came over, came over on the Mayflower. Mm -hmm. I think mine were probably in the bottom. So there's some recreation. Actually, my so, family. Excuse my, me. My, would you my, just answer my the question were about the social servants. program? My, my relative was an indentured servant. Would you okay? answer the question about the social program, please? What, what's the Why question? Why is it a social program? Because it's 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 a benefit to a very limited number of people. That's not true. You don't know all the locations. Okay. I suggest that. Uh, will you let me finish, please? How many people, I how suggest many that you get a listing of every ETPA Jane, listed in every new less. municipality, and then you will see exactly who lives in a rent stabilized apartment. It's not black, Hispanics, and poor people. That's all I, I have to I, say. Okay. Why do black, only blacks and Hispanics Because when someone from says social, social I, I think, I think when you say there, there social, you always Ms. refer Mrs. to Q people that are of a That's not the case at all. Mr. That's not the case at all. Don't use those terms. You don't want the explanation. If you go out to Williamsburg, most of the projects in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, are not occupied by black people. You stop. One second. One second. They're occupied by white people. Thank you. This is not what we're here for. Who wants to go first? Tamara Stewart. board members and my fellow citizens. My name is Tamara Stewart and I'm a tenant in the tenant leadership of Westchester Plaza, the largest apartment complex in the city of Mount Vernon. When I spoke to you last Monday in Mount Vernon, I stated that limited rental stock, short-term preferential rents, unnecessary individual apartment improvements, and aggressive eviction tactics contribute to Westchester Plaza residents being rent burdened, with many spending 50% or more of their income just to pay rent. Retirees, senior citizens, and the disabled are particularly prone to being severely rent burdened. As my mother, Joan Wilson, testified last week, even with scree, she is spending 70% of her income on rent, and her rent is below market rate. I was deeply disturbed and angered to hear Mr. Rabikoff, who spoke last week, ask this board to double the rent on one of his tenants that is a senior citizen paying less than market rent. 
I don't know whether Mrs. Lazama has the means to pay twice as much rent and still live with some reasonable measure of dignity and comfort. But I can assure you that my mom and many other seniors can't. And the waiting list for subsidized senior housing in Mount Vernon is five years long. Now I would like to speak for someone who isn't here to speak for herself. My friend and neighbor, Ricky Williams, was almost 80 years old, a champion bowler, and she loved to play Big West. Petite and extremely independent, Miss Ricky and her two cats lived modestly in her one-bedroom apartment for many years. Last year, management took Miss Ricky to court because she fell behind on her rent. Thankfully, Dennis Hanratty helped her stave off eviction and apply for scrape. While she was fighting for her home, Miss Ricky was also bravely battling cancer for the third time. Sadly, my feisty friend lost her battle with cancer and died in January, at which time her two cats became homeless. Ricky Williams should not have had to worry about becoming homeless while she was fighting for her life. Please pass no or minimal increases so that Miss Ricky's neighbors on fixed incomes don't wind up homeless like her cats. Thank you. Joe? Uh, just so I understand it, what was the waiting list that you spoke about five years, the waiting list for... The waiting list for subsidized senior housing in Mount Vernon, five years long. And subsidized, would that just include what, ETPA, Section 8? HUD, anything where there's some kind of income requirement to, that, okay. that takes okay. into account people who are making very little. I see. Thank Anything you. in that in that arena, at least five years. Long. Thank you. Tamara, Tamara could you just tell what the screen is, is what, it, what, what it represents for people that don't know? Excuse me. What, S, what SCRIE is? SCRI is senior citizens. It's a reduction for senior citizens who are, have low incomes. So even though she was receiving SCRI and her rent was below market rate. She still fell behind, and a lot of seniors are still falling behind. So all the owners who are talking about how, you know, people need to pay market rate. Some people, they can't even afford to pay the below market rate they're paying now. I mean, they just can't. They don't have the income to do it. Sorry. No, no, no. Any other questions? Not audience questions are not appropriate at this time. But did you sign the list if you want to speak? How long was she a tenant? How long was she a tenant Wait. there? Over a decade. Den Dennis probably knows better than I do. I mean, a lot of the, the, the seniors that I'm thinking of who are getting pressured to, to you know, have, by management to get them out, they've had their apartments, you know, a decade, two decades, three decades. They can't afford to live anyplace else. Thank you very much. Uh, Lisa DeRosa. Lisa DeRosa, is she here? Okay, we'll come back to her if, uh, later if we can. Ken Nilsson? If you have the handout. The water ring handout? Yeah. It's in the chart they had, Ken. Uh, my name is Ken Nelson. Uh, I'm a uh, president of the Nelson Management Company, landlord in Yonkers. Uh, I'd like to talk about three things. You're going to have to tell us. Uh, one is utility cost. If you look at your tables, the tables that were handed out to you on table number Roman numeral three. This is the tables that you got from DHCR. Oh, oh. Uh, it shows that utility, the utility costs on the surveys went up by 9.7% uh, from 
2012 to 2013. Um, one of the big, one of the big, one of the contributor to that could be the increase, the the uh, fact that landlords are converting from oil to gas. But a, a significant part of that is the fact that water rates are increasing dramatically. And that the table that was handed out to you that says Yonkers water rates is typical of the cities of, of, of Lower Westchester, it looks like this, where from 2007 uh, the water rate per thousand, uh, per hundred cubic feet was $1.15, and in 2014 it increased to $2.55. That's an increase uh, cumulative of 122% over uh, basically seven years. And so, uh, for a total building, what that converts to is that, and where it got my attention, is that for a building where the cost that over six months used to be $6,000, is now $12,000. It becomes a significant item. So, I think that's one of the things you need to consider in, in your evaluation. It's dramatic. Uh, uh, the second thing is management costs. If you look again at your table, Roman numeral three, management costs went up by 4.2 percent. And uh, I want to talk about some of the things that go into management fee. If you look at the description on the table, uh, on, on the instructions that we received to fill out that form, it includes management fees, office salaries, expenses, managers, and office salaries, legal and accounting expenses. And what's happening is that Basically, government regulations have been a big part of that increase. For example, in just in the last year, there was uh, a, uh, a law passed uh, having to do with sources of income uh, that, that uh, uh, landlords cannot discriminate against tenants because of source of income. Uh, this has increased the, uh, the documentation requirements, uh, the kinds of things you have to do in the office. Uh, a second item has to do with is, is something called the. You get five. Don't worry. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, a, 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 the tenant protection unit, which is set up by DHCR, uh, to uh, uh, basically I I I I would like to to rename it the LHU, which is the landlord harassment unit, uh, which is which is functions to 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 review re, uh, rent increases usually on, on vacant apartments what's happened is that in some of the experiences that we, people have had in Westchester is that it takes a tremendous amount of effort to respond to the to the to the inquiries and the inquiries uh, don't come in the form of a request they come in the form of a, a subpoena and in some cases landlords have had to hire lawyers to be able to present their case to the tenant protection unit. This all basically contributes to the to the to the cost. A another regulation change that occurred when when the the New York State uh, requirements for heat increased. It used to be uh, 68 degrees in in the day, and and basically originally was 60 degrees at night, and then it went to 65, and now it's 68 degrees. So what they're doing is increasing the requirements. Uh, that you heat that 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 fact increases the amount of cost for you know oil and gas just to heat the thing. So this is a government requirement. We're required to to do it, but there is cost connected with it. And all of these things are kind of well-meaning ideas, but they cost money. And somebody sitting in Albany or in uh, in Westchester County uh, Board of Legislators think these things are a good idea, uh, but the fact is. There's a dollar cost connected with it, and those are being reflected in those costs you have. So those increases are real increases requiring additional, basically, in most cases, labor. You either have lawyers you have to hire or additional uh, requirements in the office. I've had to hire an additional person in the office mainly to deal with, with the responding to government requirements. Um, okay. I have one more thing. The last thing is that on your on your 
uh, tabulation from DHCR. I just want to point out that the uh, vacancy tables are basically totally misleading and should not be used because they only, uh, and based on the instructions provided by DHCR, and you can confirm this with uh, your people, is that do not report preferential rents, but only legal regulated rents. So, for example, if a rent go, if, if you have an apartment that's previously rented for $1,000, and, and that's close to market, the reality is now it may go up to $1,020, a 2% increase. But the legal regulated rent, based on the rules of DHCR, would go up to uh, uh, could, could go up 20% to $1,200. The $1,200 will show on this table, but that's not what people are really paying. They're really paying a 2% increase as opposed to a 20% increase. So this table will show the 20% increase where indeed it's only a 2% increase. And I think you as a board have to understand that in setting your guidelines. So I, I think this is not, is is, is totally misleading. It should not be used for anything in setting the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. My time has run out. If you have any Don't questions, I'd be pleased to answer. Uh, yes. Ms. Rubin? Uh, what would you suggest we use instead? Do what? you have any, any other alternative to you? Well, the, the, the fact is that uh, we, as landlords, are required to register every ETPA apartment with the state. And so we fill out a little form for the state, and now we have to do it electronically, but we send a copy to the tenant. The state has every apartment that's registered under ETPA in their computers. You can ask the state, which is DHCR, to tabulate that, and that will give you inf all the information you need. They've never been willing to do that for, I don't know why, but anyway, it's there. Yes, uh, Mr. Nelson. I, I, don't want to. I know you, you have a number of uh, rental properties in Yonkers. Yes. Could you tell me uh, about how many evictions did you have from last year's hearings until this year? Because a lack of, for the, la the, the eviction because they could not pay their rent? Uh, I don't have that number. And I'm not sure that's necessarily appropriate for an individual to respond to that as opposed to well, if you want tabulations well, on that. Well, Mr. Nelson, we've heard testimony where the tenant, Ms. Mm -hmm. Stewart, spoke about people no, who were not able to pay their right. rent. The reason that it is relative mm -hmm. is because if the rent is so high, over 1500 1700 mm -hmm. and a person's income does not meet the criteria to, cannot afford it, mm -hmm. so they get eviction, evicted. I just want to know about yeah. how many people well, are evicted. Well, I, I know. From your first buildings. to start with is that is that before we, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically consider renting to someone, we we screen them. They fill out a form. They provide us documentation, mm -hmm. which uh, our our standard is that 30 percent of their income, usually a third of their income should go to go to go to rents when uh, unless they're unless their they're job. subsidized let, let unless they're you know, know unless they're subsidized in some cases and we have section that, 8 that, tenants that, as well. that wasn't the question I asked. yeah but the idea is that if, if circumstances change and they can't pay the rent uh, I can't you know I can't allow them to stay there but you don't have the number but I don't have the number I don't have the number to tell you there, there were some. I, I don't, I don't know if it was significant. Uh, some people, we start court proceedings and they eventually pay. Some people only pay when I start court proceedings. Uh, but uh, and some people, if they get into situations where they are, you know, in need, and they go to, for instance, Department of Social Services, they explain the situation. If, if the need is. Uh, is valid, then they will they will help them, and they've, they've done that in many situations. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Yes. Let me ask you something. You you said that you believe you consider the vacancy tables to be misleading because uh, the instructions from the uh, HCR tell the uh, owners not to report preferential rents. Yes. Um, 
which I, I didn't quite understand, you know, your mm -hmm. points in that regard. Oh, because but, the, all right, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, but, but what interests me is, on the one hand, the owners say that they don't, uh, they, they need higher and higher increases mm -hmm. because of increasing costs of water and taxes and mm -hmm. fuel and so forth and so on. But on the other hand, there it would be interesting to know at least how many units uh, are occupied by people who do have preferential rents because even with the increases, the owners can't get renters to pay those rents. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if you have any kind of information as to... I, 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 don't, I don't have that. Again, that the registration here, information has all that information, so if you can get um, <laughs> DHCR to crank those tables, well, they, they exist. Maybe we can. Uh, but, uh, uh, so, what happens is that, in, you know, in, in that situation, in, for instance, the example I gave you, is that would be the market, and then the market controls what, what happens. And so right. someone is saying, well, you know, the you know, income is not going up. If and a landlord raises the, 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 the you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, rent above the market, he's not going to rent it. He's not going to rent the apartment. And right. so the market controls what he can, what he can do. Now, but the, or, yeah, right. But, uh, but there are a substantial number of apartments that are below the market, and these usually don't become vacant. It's only the ones that are at market that turn over a lot. That's the reality. People stay in the, if they have low rents, they're going to stay there until, you know, they have to uh, leave. Um, so. Anybody else? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Carol Danziger. That's the worst thing about anything. I had a client coming. So she lived. She lived in a car. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Carol Danziger. I'm going to do my best. I get a little nervous oh, <laughs> speaking in public. Um, I guess I would consider myself a wife, a mother, and a new grandmother, <laughs> as well as a second-generation apartment owner. My brother, my sisters, and I inherited a 18-unit apartment building in the Maronick uh, when our father passed five years ago. Um, as a small business owner, we consider you know, running the building a small business, no different than your local plumber, than your local grocery store. Um, and I can tell you from our experience, I can't give you data for everybody, but I can tell you what we go through. Uh, one of the most difficult challenges for us is um, major repairs that are needed on the building. Um, it's 80 years old. We've had a lot of things come up, especially in the last about six years. Our regular maintenance is done in-house. My brother takes care of most of the basic things because we really can't afford to outsource that. But there are large ticket items that have to be done. We had to update electrical. We had to um, update a boiler that um, the original boiler cracked. We had to do a major repair to the outside facade of the building. And now currently we're trying to replace windows um, within the building. Um, I can tell you that um, we did put in an MCI when we replaced the boiler. I don't want to go into the details, but they actually denied um, an MCI for a new boiler when we converted to gas, and it was a whole long, horrible process, I can tell you. And as a small owner, we just did not have the time or the resources to legally fight it. Um, it's nice, the idea of an MCI, the idea of having a few dollars per uh, room to help cover the expense, but the problem is is that you have to front the forty or fifty thousand dollars needed to make these repairs, and that's what our greatest problem is. We'll spend a year scraping and doing the bare minimum to create what you would consider a profit for the building, um, but not to see that profit even though we have to claim it on our personal taxes. We have to reinvest that into the building to do the major repairs and then the following year the whole process starts over again. One reason um, for this are once again the very low rents um, in the building, we have 
four long-term tenants that are currently paying less than $600 a month. One of those is a two-bedroom. We have two units at less than 900 a month, and we have, I think, four less than 1,000. We only have one that would even be close to market, and I don't even think it's at market. Um, we're not asking to raise rents to force those tenants out of their apartments. What we're asking for is when these long-term apartments become vacant, we need to be able to raise those to an adequate level. Um, just as an example, I know that you had mentioned, oh, I'm sorry, I know that you had, had said before you were talking about what benchmark would you use on vacancy rents. I would use HUD median 60% rates um, for those vacant units. Those are the approved rates by Westchester County, provided by Westchester County for all their housing programs like Section 8. I would be more than happy to accept those, not to have you reinvent the wheel or decide what's fair. Westchester County already has decided what's fair. That is for low income, 60% of median income individuals. And once again, these are not the people that are already in there. These are the apartments that become vacant. If Westchester County says it's affordable, then it should be considered affordable for me as well. Yes, I am going to wrap it up. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You throw me off a little bit. Um, also, as a small business owner, we're providing a subsidy of housing for individuals when no one has even determined whether or not the individuals taken advantage of it are needy of it. I can tell you just by the information provided by tenants, oh, tell us. Okay, provided by the last six tenants that moved into the building, five out of the six, according to the income level, they provided to us were over 60% of median income, which means they would not have qualified for any county program, such as Section 8. So I'm just asking that you help us with the vacancy rates, because it's those four units at $600. If one of our tenants moved out tomorrow in a two-bedroom apartment paying $563, if we took 0.6%, which is the increase more than eight years of no vacancy, times by the 64 years the gentleman lived there. Your time is there. really up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's way over. It's way, way over. Yes. Oh, so sorry, please, no. you've got to wrap it up. Oh, okay. Can you put your windows in? One second. No. One second. Well, that's if you can get an MCI approved. Just, MCI, what does MCI, MCI say? Can, can we please not have people calling out from $899 would be the maximum we can raise that two-bedroom to which isn't even close what was the to the HUD, $899. If you take the 64 years at 0.6 and the 20% increase, it comes to $899. Well, you know, this, this board doesn't have any authority to change what the law provides as to vacancy increases and so forth. It does. Well, you do. You tell us it's 20%. No, no, but we don't tell you that that's part of that's in the law. Uh, we don't. We don't. That, that we don't give any sort of by statute. That's no, like, can't statute. you do an additional like the point no, six percent? Can't what you bring do. it up to that's a not reasonable that's level? Not that is not within point our point six is not you as well. Purview. Um, that could uh, Mr. Finger. Would you be supportive of a low rent increase to bring up apartments when they, uh, uh, if they are below a certain <laughs> amount of rent per room or per unit? If it, if it would help increase everyone to what's considered a reasonable level for the county, absolutely. I think that's I mean, I'm only asking to charge what any other non-ETPA building would get to charge. And I have had no evictions, by the way, in the last two years. And the only eviction we had was someone who decided they no longer wanted to pay their rent. And I have never, ever evicted a senior citizen. I live with my tenants. I know all my tenants. I, I remember yeah, that from last year. <laughs> I still live with them. <laughs> the vacancy allowance goes back to, if you want to do your research, to 1997, when that was re, if, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, when that was for Westchester County. Mm -hmm. Particularly, because that's I, could, I live here, so I can only yeah. focus on Westchester County. That was not done on 
our level. Mm -hmm. That was state level. And well, just, if there's anything you can do on your level, we pass guidelines. Just, we pass yeah. guidelines. Do something for low rent because it's 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 killing us. When you convert it to gas, that's less than oil. Than oil. How um, much? Yes, we actually put in two boilers to help it be more affordable. All right. So that enables us, like I said, to make some of the repairs, but in no way. So what are you saving a percentage on fuel versus what you were spending? Oh, I would have to look back. It's not a huge amount, oh, but it's something. I mean, it's something. I can tell you my, my utilities as a whole went up 10% last year. I think it's because of the weather. Yes. Okay. And our taxes from what I paid in 2012 to 2013 was 3%. I'm just going by the actual checks I wrote. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Ms. Morgan. Uh, mm -hmm. yes. Had a question? Yes. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Okay, on your point about the 60%, could you give an example because median income, who's median income, and it, how do you calculate levels, it? These are levels calculated. One calculated. second, is I'm it sorry. only for vacancies, or when do you apply that? And uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, no, questions. No, we don't apply anything to the people moving in because there is no means test for the people moving into the building. I was just using those figures because those are the approved figures as adopted by the county and provided by HUD. Now what's the 60% then as adopted by the county and provided by HUD? 60% of median income? Who's, who's I'd, income? I'd, 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 I'd like to see an example. You're saying... Oh, households. Households. Household, household income. It's different depending on how many people in the household mm -hmm. and how many rooms in the apartment, but they're all published by the county. I can actually give you the... I think yeah, it's do. on the county website. It's on the website. Oh, yeah, it's on the under website. what, HUD or under some I other? I think it's on median family income levels. Mm -hmm. All right, now how, income it, level and how and does, level. I'm just curious, how does that apply to me if I want to rent an apartment? Somebody looks something if up at a table and a, tells me what? If you want to rent a subsidized apartment and get a rent subsidy, like Section 8, mm -hmm. then you would have to qualify at or below 60% of the median income that HUD determined. To be oh, so the they're county. defining needy yes. for me. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's well, I'm needy too. if my income, you do the 60%. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's what HUD tells us, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Donna Cosenza. Good evening. My name is Donna Casenza. My husband and I own a small building in Hastings on Hudson, in which there are eight rental units. We purchased this building 30 years ago. At that time, we had owned our own delicate housing business for eight years. We are already working seven days a week, 95 hours each. The thought was that no matter what happened with our business, eventually the mortgage on the rental building would be paid and we would make a profit. This was to be our retirement. Over the years, we've added a new roof and new windows by MCI. We've done as much repairs and maintenance ourselves as we can, trying to keep our costs to a minimum. As has already been stated, this doesn't include heat, water, and taxes, which cannot be controlled. Last fall, we tore out and replaced our entire driveway and parking lot and rebuilt it, three whole layers. Obviously, this was something we couldn't do ourselves. The cost was almost $15,000. This is considered maintenance and, as such, cannot be submitted for MCI. That's a lot to swallow for a small building owner that keeps things cutting it close. Second, at the meetings in Mount Vernon and Yonkers, I heard people speak of fixed income. While well, Social Security recipients received a 1.7% increase in 2013 and a 1.5% increase in 2014. It's a bit different for us working stiffs. Ever since closing our deli in 1994, after 18 long years, my husband has worked two jobs to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table for our four children. In 1999, when my youngest started school, I rejoined the workforce as well. In the last few years, 
Sorry. In the last few years, my husband's full-time jobs company has struggled due to the economy. His hours have fluctuated greatly, losing 20% of his pay at times. They also cut his rate per hour. Did he complain? No. He asked for as many additional hours as possible from his second job, ShopRite Dairy Department. Picture a 60-year-old man working in tight quarters in the walk-in refrigerator, lifting cases over his head in order to load up a U-boat with faulty wheels so he could drag it out and stock the shelves. He has never slowed down. Even after a heart attack that required bypass surgery. This year, due to the Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, ShopRite also has cut back hours just enough so it doesn't have to offer health care. No health, no dental, no vision, nothing. No more extra hours to make up for those lost to the other job. Third, most of our tenants are respectable people who treat their space with care, leaving it room clean and in good condition when they move. But there have been also those who give no thought to how they use and abuse their living space. Legally, we can only take one month's security, but tenants, more often than not, use that security as their last month's rent. And truthfully, there's not much we can do about it. Even a tenant who's only been in occupancy for one year can destroy bathroom ceramic tile floor, expensive, kitchen tile floor, but holes fist size through the doors. This is beyond the normal cleaning, painting, and floor finishing. Sometimes it takes literally hours to clean a stove and oven due to the condition it was left in. I believe that if tenants could own their own space, pay their own heat, pay their own water, pay their own taxes, perform or hire out their own repairs, they might be a little more understanding as to what it takes to run a building. Truthfully, I've had enough. I want to sell the building. I don't want to listen to any further tenants' complaints regarding bad landlords. It has nothing to do with the rent guidelines and nothing to do with me. The rent guidelines are based on cost increase, and yes, the costs are most definitely increasing. That is the one and only issue that should be discussed. One more thing I'd like to add, actually. You talked about affordable housing. I live in the town of Cortland. Croton, Kruger's, Montrose, Buchanan, Peekskill, Cortland Manor. They did just build, I think it was 80 units of affordable housing right up the road from me. And you know what? If my husband had died before he had that surgery, my salary, I could have moved in there. And I'm a building owner. How long did you say you've owned the building? 30 years. 30 years. And it was your investment for retirement? Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. Thank you. Okay. What is your uh, building? Did you say it's in Hastings? Hastings on Hudson. Okay. Okay. Mr. Wheeler? Uh, just give a little profile. How many units? How many one-bedrooms? Eight. 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 Yeah, I'm sorry. I missed it. I know you That's mentioned okay. it. And then uh, are they... A mix of studio, two bedroom hub? Uh, I have one one bedroom and the other seven are two bedroom. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You. Joan Wilson? No, good. Joan Wilson, Tamara's mother. No. Joan Wilson. Oh, Donna. Yes. Good evening again. Yes, Feels like the Groundhog yes, Day sequel we met in Mount Vernon last week. Tag teaming with my daughter again this week to speak about questionable practices by landlords who give property ownership a bad name. Here's my story. And I'm sorry for the lady who just spoke. You didn't want to hear any more complaints by tenants, but you got another one. Okay. <clears throat> when my husband of 30 years died in January of 2009, it took time for me to appreciate the powerful transition I was now facing as a widow. We had requested long overdue repairs from our landlord several years before my husband's illness and death. 
Since we had been in our little studio apartment for more than 14 years, we didn't feel our request for a fresh coat of paint, critical repairs on flooring, basic bathroom plumbing, and a few other things would be an issue. We were wrong. After allowing myself time to grieve his death, when I finally had the mental and emotional fortitude to pursue the needed repairs, I discovered how much armor, support, and information I need to obtain the quality of services long overdue to me. Faxes, phone calls, and written requests sent by certified mail yielded no results, or even a reply from my landlord. Only with help from my very capable daughter, the Mount Vernon Building Department, Legal Services of the Hudson Valley, and Freedom of Information Request to Mount Vernon's Law Department, things began to shift. However, only after a lengthy battle, apartment inspections, documenting and photographing the need for repairs and violations being served by the building department, did my landlord grudgingly concede to do the needed repairs three years later. But to add insult to injury, my property owners attempt, attempted to have me pay full rent for the two months it took to complete these significant repairs in an apartment whose conditions were uninhabitable. Floors torn up, no stove or refrigerator, no bathroom plumbing, dust everywhere. They wanted to charge me rent for an uninhabitable space and took me to court in an attempt to evict me for non-payment. Most troubling is that my story is not unique. Rent-burdened elders like myself on fixed incomes paying below market rents are easy targets for harassment and retaliation by landlords <coughs> who simply want us to move out with no place to go. We know you have no power to change a depressed economy, stagnant wages, and the rising cost of everything. But you do have the power to vote to freeze rent increases so I don't find myself homeless like Miss Ricky's cats. Thank you. You live in Mount Vernon? I live in Mount Vernon. Anybody else? 45 Park Avenue. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Wilson. How much does it pay rent? That's not relevant. Carmelo Milio. Carmelo? It's not Carmelo? That's not relevant. She's not section eight. Excuse me? You refer to the end on the industry speaker? What? He's the last speaker. He's the last speaker. He's the last speaker. So just have him pass to the end. Well, why? Why should he go Well, I... Why? Because he has to come back and speak as the industry leader. He defers to another speaker. He's deferring to another speaker. Well, he has the right I'm to do sorry. that. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm right calling on you because there are only two speakers left. I've gone tenant, owner, tenant, owner, and it's your turn. He's the last speaker. The okay. last speaker is Mr. Hanratty, who is last on the list. I, I, know, that, I know that Mr. Milia wanted to speak at the end, even though he's only fourth on the list, and I... I've tried to... Uh, oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're getting a copy of my speech. Five minutes. Huh? Five minutes. Uh, 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 you see, uh, I'm not sure. Five minutes. Well, Excuse me, Thank you all. Any more? Thank you for listening to me. I'm Carmelo Emilio. I'm an owner and property manager of ETPA regulated apartments in Yonkers, Mount Vernon, or Rochelle in the Bronx. I'm also the chairman of, apartment owners, of the Apartment Owners Advisory Council of Westchester and the Mid Hudson Region. The AOAC represents approximately 300 owners of nearly 20,000 apartments regulated by ETPA. And as the chairman, it's important that I take the opportunity to express to you how important your decision is for the real estate industry and for everyone sitting in this room. 
As a representative of the real estate industry, I do not get paid to stand here and plea on behalf of landlords or tenants, but I do so because I care for an industry that provides much needed housing that many Americans strive to be a part of. As a kid, I remember going around to a few small properties that my family owned, and I helped with cleaning, painting, and miscellaneous duties. During those days, it was a dream, it was a dream come true to own real estate for my family. 20 years later, the mentality has changed for not only my family, but for many landlords throughout Westchester County. The reality is that, once, that this once sought after American dream is now becoming a nightmare, especially for smaller landlords. Many landlords have been forced to sell or walk away from their buildings that may have been passed down to them from previous generations or was purchased with their life savings. You guys have already heard several stories on behalf of, um, of owners that are dealing with this. If you drive down many streets in our biggest cities, you will see boarded up buildings, mainly smaller buildings. I, also, I ask you to take a good look at the men and women sitting on both sides of the aisle in front of us. There is no exception, tenant or landlord, that doesn't get affected by a deteriorating building or neighborhood. We are all affected when a building is boarded up, regardless if you're the resident, landlord, or neighbor. Think about the last time you drove down the street and saw a 100-unit building boarded up. Never, because it doesn't happen. You must keep this in mind. Your decision affects the little guys much more than the much larger corporate owners. To be honest with you, if I was a tenant living in a small building, I'd be nervous that my landlord would someday sell or give up, because the way the market is, he, may, he or she may be forced to sell or walk away from the building altogether. If we continue to push out the smaller guys, then the larger corporations will find ways to come in, deregulate units, or convert the condos. And please remember, the majority of local owners are small mom and pop owners. As per the DHCR tables, we lost 4,750 units to deregulation over the past five years. During that same time period, the average increase has been 1.8% for a one-year lease and a 2.85% for a, for a two-year lease. These are historically low increases, and deregulation continues to increase regardless of how low you go. Hopefully, you all know that this, histor that this historically low increases have not slowed down this trend, but in fact has sped it up. This is a clear sign that landlords will do whatever they can to get out of ETPA if we continue to create a hostile environment within the industry. The answer to slowing down this trend and maintaining adequate affordable housing is to create a stable environment within the affordable housing industry. Fair increases result in improved buildings, less abandonment, and less deregulation. I would like to repeat that the answer to slowing down this trend and maintaining adequate affordable housing is to create a stable environment within the affordable housing industry. The DHCR financial tables reflect an average size building of 32 units. The board has to remember that your decision is mainly affecting the smaller landlords. Last year, Silvio Solari, a small <coughs> landlord of 11 units in Lower Westchester, showed clear proof of his average expenses going up at a faster, than, faster pace than his income. Silvio was a prime example of a good landlord leaving the market. In 1995, he owned over 30 units, and 19 years later, he has sold off all his property. He said, and I quote, I had to sell off my units because I could not properly maintain the properties and decided to seek better opportunities. After selling off all his property, Silvio has no financial benefit to a large increase, but continues to speak to you as a public member. I want to reiterate again the reasons why owners like Silvio and Donna, that you heard earlier, want out. It's actually very simple. For many landlords, this is their livelihoods. For some, these are their homes. And the reality is that there is no future, and it does not look positive. When you tell someone that you can only raise the rents 1%, but your heating expenses is up 9%, it's a no-brainer that it's time to move on. We've got about five pages left. All right. Well, All right, I'll skip over. You, you guys, have to uh, skip something, but you, you can read it. You can read it. Yeah, James. All right. Excuse me. In, what? in the past, if someone has He's been... Oh. What? Joe, I, what? I want to talk to Jane. May I? Yes. Okay. 
In the past, if someone was speaking for the whole industry, we never limited them to five minutes. Well, we were... Including tenants, owners, anybody. It'll be done within another five minutes. Well, you, right. you don't have another five minutes. But take another three. Just oh, wow. talk yeah. fast. Yeah. All right. I want everybody... I... We never did that. All right. The DHCR survey showed that the average monthly cost to operate an apartment in Westchester TPA buildings is $1,024. This, of course, poses the question we ask each year. Why should those paying rents at market subsidize those paying way below market? I would, like to, I would like the board to ask themselves to justify the following facts as I will give you a specific example. In one of our managed buildings in Mount Vernon, I have two two-bedroom units rented in the same building. One tenant pays $1,400 and the other $668. This is a difference of $732 and is more than double the rent of the lower unit. I understand that the perception is that low rents help the tenants that are less fortunate. The reality is that in this case, and in many other cases, these units are fully renovated, and the two units I mentioned are identical units, but unit A is paying double rent, so unit B can live comfortably. <coughs> As tenants are aware, there are many of these cases, and this emphasizes the need to bring extremely low rents up, regardless of their starting rent. There is no reason that two of the same size units should be paying drastically different amounts <coughs> of annual increases. A minimum rent increase is the only way that all tenants can be treated equally. A minimum rent increase is a must and is justifiable on behalf of landlords and tenants. As we all know, landlords supply the only major amount of affordable housing in Westchester County. The growing issue they have is that they never seem to catch up to the increases in our operating expenses with the rental increases that the board has set in the past. I believe that the mentality of the board must change. It's my perspective that when the economy is on an upswing, the increases go down because landlords are doing well. When things are bad, the increases go down because the economic pains are emphasized for the tenants instead of the owners. If and when the rates move up, it is slightly and not as dramatic as the decreases, like the zero-zero increases that were imposed a few years ago. What you have to understand is that we need some sort of stability in our industry. When things go well for landlord, that's their opportunity to improve their aging building, and please also remember that landlords are allowed to make a small profit. Penalizing landlords for making a modest profit is equal to you working for free for your company. No one should be penalized for working hard and being compensated for it, no matter what industry you are in, and especially when those positive years help carry you during the negative ones. I want to put this in a way that I expressed land last year and that you, the board, can all personally relate to. I want you all to take a second, this is very important, I want you all to take a second to think of your superior or boss at your everyday job for a moment. As a rent guidelines board, you are that person to every landlord that has ETPA regulated apartments in Westchester County, regardless of their management style. Based on these hearings, similar to an annual review for yourself, you will be deciding whether or not we deserve a raise. A raise that in your case would maintain your lifestyle or put food in the mouth of those who depend on you. In our case, it's a raise that supplies food to our families as well, but also maintains the quality of the buildings and the quality of life for those who reside at our properties. All right, you better just skip. Go to the, go to the, go to the worst paragraph. No, you recommend. Go to the worst paragraph. All right. I would like to propose. Well, go ahead, go for mine. The reality is that we don't need a 0% increase. Okay? Nor do we need a 10% increase. What landlords, tenants, and the real estate industry needs is a stable increase based on the DHCR numbers, which ensures a stable living environment for all. <coughs> Taking all the facts that have been given to this board, including data on increases in property taxes, water, utilities, insurance, and respectfully listening to all the other testimony, I would like to reach across the aisle and offer my opinion of a fair increase that will help stabilize the industry for both landlords and tenants. I would like to propose an increase of 4% for a one-year lease with a minimum dollar increase of $40 and an increase of 6% for a two-year lease with a minimum dollar increase of $60. I appreciate your time serving our industry as a board member and thank you for taking my comments into consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Question Mr. on uh, your statistics. Yes, I think you're on page three at the very top. 
there's a loss of 4,750 units. And then you go on to say due to deregulation. Uh, why, why are there 4,750 units? What does that word mean, deregulation? What does it include, well, they're, exclude? They're, 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 not, they're no longer stabilized apartments. So okay, so you're not... They were converted in one way or the other, if they were converted to condos, or they were deregulated yes. one way or the other, they came out of the state ETPA uh, regulations. Now, it may have been because of the, the rent rules when you get deregulated because your rents exceed a certain amount? Yes. And it may be because someone sold the building and the buyer didn't keep ETPA. Can they do that? Um, no, they can't do that. No, no, they, can't, they can't, can't buy a building. building. And, can't do that. It's always going to be stabilized. It lives with the building. Okay. Thanks. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Hmm? Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dennis handwriting. <laughs> Madam Chair, board members. One, uh, excuse me, can we wait for the handout okay. so we can follow you? Sure. Thank you. Madam Chair, Board Members, uh, members of the DHR, audience members, my name is Dennis Hanrady. I'm the Executive Director of Mount Vernon United Tenants. I testify every year. Uh, I'm not going to talk about some of the figures in the schedule, so I'm going to leave that to our capable two tenant reps who will make that presentation at next week's hearing, uh, next week's public meeting. One of the reasons is because of the late uh, receipt of uh, the documents. I haven't really got a chance to look at some of this stuff. What I did pass out was uh, the rent history of one apartment. I believe most of the board members were pretty impressed last week at the Mount Vernon hearing, or maybe even depressed is the better word, uh, when they talked to some of the people from the Plaza Building, when they talked about the rents. People were pretty surprised. Everybody's paying fifteen, sixteen, eighteen hundred dollars $1,800 a month rent. Joan Wilson, who lives right across the street, talked tonight. Uh, this tenant is from her building. She's mentioned she lives in 30 Cottage, but there's a, she lives in 45 Park, but it also she has an address with 30 Cottage. This is a tenant from 30 Cottage. And I want you to look at the registration uh, from back in, the, from 84 to 93. It was reasonable at that time, 300 and some odd dollars up to 400, 457. In 93, on page 2 of 5, goes right through to page 3. They're still in that range, up to 500, 500, until 2002 gets up to almost 600. But the big surprise is when you turn that page. Goes to the next tenant. That's my client who had just had come into my office about a week before the last hearing. So I didn't have this. I had requested this when she came into the office. So you look at 2002, the rent was $597.93. The incoming tenant, what is she paying? $1,354. That's a 126% increase. 126%. So we hear about these. Claims by the lender all, which is 2%, 3%, 126% increase. And that's not odd. That's not an aberration. These are happening all over. Okay, so that's how those rents all get up there. They get one or two up there. This may have been illegal. I'm not sure. I mean, she only came to me recently. And you're time barred from filing overcharge complaints for four years. This happened 10 years ago, so who knows? But she's stuck with that. But that's the reality that tenants have to deal with. All of those rents are up there, and all the buildings, and not these. And this is not a luxury building by any means. Uh, but you see what the rent is now. That rent is over seventeen hundred dollars. The rent is now seventeen eleven. She moves out, and she's fighting an eviction now with the vacancy allowance. And people keep talking about they want to raise the rent. You're entitled to a twenty percent increase, so that would bring it up to two thousand fifty-three without any work being done. She does some work, then it's going to get over. It used to be two thousand dollars was the threshold to deregulate it. And uh, for our prior speaker, I asked about these deregulations. High rent vacancy, only 134 this past year, 235 the year before, 561 the year before, 439 the year before, 482. So you've got 2,000 units right there that have been deregulated. High rent vacancy decontrol. Those don't show up in the figures with 
that we're talking about either. So that's already, that's money in the landlord's pockets, people getting over $2,500 a month rent. Uh, so I think this board should take that into consideration as well. Uh, my good friend Tamar talked about the rent burdens. The U.S. Census did some numbers crunching on that. In Mount Vernon, 60.3% of tenants are rent burdened. 60.3%. Three out of five tenants are rent burdened. In Yonkers, it's 55.3%. New Rochelle, it's 59%. These are all people whose quality of life is being seriously, seriously compromised because of ever-increasing rents. That's a thing that you guys have got to take into consideration. And I want to thank my friend Ken Nelson bringing up the fact that rents have gotten up past the market very often, the rent-stabilized rents, because of these generous increases that have been granted under both the state allowances for vacancies, the 20% plus increases, plus the increases this board has guaranteed or authorized so many more rent stabilized tenants are paying more than the market now. So they've got to do these preferential rents. At the Mount Vernon hearing, I went over a little bit about the preferential rents. For those of you who are, who are not familiar with it, that's where the rents have gotten up so high so quickly, it's even the legal regulated rents have surpassed the market. Uh, we need this system. This is not a social program. This is a rent regulated program. We realize there's a housing emergency out there. Remember the law is the Emergency Tenant Protection Act. There's a housing emergency. Everybody has to be mindful of this emergency. People are facing eviction on a regular basis. Uh, you've heard the lady speak earlier. I mean, I deal with this stuff on a daily basis. It brings tears to your eyes when you see what happens. People spending 50, 60 percent of their incomes for rent. We're going to have some more data about these rent burdens next week. So I'm going to, you know, not talk all that much tonight because uh, I'm going to leave it open if there's any questions. But the one thing I just gave you, 120 percent, 126 percent increase, not an aberration. This is on a regular basis. We see these things. In both of their complexes across the street, everybody's paying fifteen, sixteen, seventeen hundred dollars. And when you get up to those rents, then people get brought to court, and they get brought to court pretty regularly, and then the rents go up again. What it does, it destroys a sense of community. And I've seen this in buildings throughout Mount Vernon. Uh, this the whole where people used to live as a family, they knew each other in the building. There's continual turnover because the rents have gotten up so high so quickly and so dramatically. Uh, so I'm asking this board, they do have a responsibility to the communities that we serve to make sure that this stuff doesn't get worse. Uh, it's bad enough now. Uh, people talk about, well, how do they afford some of these rents? What happens also, I mean, I see it more and more frequently, people doubling up, tripling up. Uh, you talk about quality of life being compromised. That's the only way they can afford these seventeen, eighteen hundred dollar a month rent. Because we clearly know, and that will be documented next week, uh, incomes have not kept pace with these rent increases. So have, what people have to do, they have to, you know, do whatever they can, get extra people, rent out a room and things like that, which really hurts the whole community. Uh, I think that's all I really want to say right now, uh, and I look forward to uh, next week to hear our guys' presentation and landlords as well, but I'm entertaining any questions. Anybody? Mr. Wheeler? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm just looking at this is a six-room apartment. So typically, is that two-bedroom or three-bedroom? That would probably be a three. I mean, that's a big apartment. Yeah, that's probably a three-bedroom, I would assume. Okay. Just curious what, yeah. that, what that means. Okay, yeah. thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you, Dennis. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Oh, really? No, it is not. We have uh, one person uh, that I was advised to uh, sign the list. David Locklear, and here he is. Good evening. One of the qualities of a good debater is to be able to wait, 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 wait. What's his name? David, David Locklear. Locklear. Okay, and you're Resident, addressing the board, right? All right. Resident Joe. Tenant, Mount Mount Vernon. Else? That's fine. Thank you. One of the qualities of a good debater is to be able to argue both sides. I'm a little amazed that there are so few people here tonight, and particularly less uh, the guy from Castle Oil, for example. I always wonder, you know, because of, of 
how great the customer base is? Do they come out and they volunteer to do this? Yes. Because I doubt that. Thank you. Great debate. Uh, this gentleman back here who's not on anybody's side. We're all taxpayers. Amen. Yeah. And the people who work the small jobs are the greatest part of the tax base of the whole country, mm -hmm. not just part of it. The landlords have the greatest write-off potential. Mm -hmm. Owning buildings in four, five, six towns, you can't help but be rich. Mm -hmm. Sir. Uh, please, um, don't. please, please don't call out, sir. You had your opportunity to speak. I show so, our speakers the same courtesy. Thank you. You just took away about 30 seconds of my time. You can have it back. Thank you. So, the small guys, we are the taxpayers. We are what supports the country. And our country's in deep stuff right now. If we listen to everything that's said on the news, we, Section 8, we all talk about subsidies. Mm -hmm. Section eight is the cut is the cause of rent starting to go beyond market rates as of about fifteen years ago. And the landlords have been taking advantage of that all of these years. Yes. The reality is, uh Hastings on uh, uh, Dobbs Ferry, somebody said something about an eight unit building. I could see possibly there being several tenants in that building based on the neighborhood that are still low. And I'll bet you there's not a black or Hispanic or minority in that building. I, I, that's, that's my opinion. All right? I've listened to yours. He's out of order. Chairperson, he's out of order. You are. How so? He, please, let him, let him say what he has to say. Let, let, let Mr. Locklear say what he has to say. Please don't call out. The reality is the young lady who talked about a delicatessen that was worked for 18 years and was just recently sold. The smallest bodega. Okay. In any neighborhood, I'm almost there. You get, you get 30 and more seconds. Yeah, 45. The smallest <laughs> bodega in I'll any ghetto, thank you, <laughs> never suffers. They make plenty of money. You cannot tell me that a, a, that a delicatessen in Hastings, anywhere in that neighborhood, didn't make $200,000 a year. <laughs> I don't care where it was. It was in that neighborhood. And with regard to... When, when part of the family that was working the deli so hard, somebody was taking acting lessons. Because I've never seen so much anybody break down in tears. Uh, Ms. Who has Mr. so much Lockley. money there? Yes, Lockley. I got 30 That's seconds left. No, you don't have 30 seconds left. You have two seconds left. Two seconds left, Mr. Two seconds left, Mr. Watch two seconds left, Mr. Watch Watch you don't want to. Is that a threat, sir? No. I'm no. Lying, sir. All right. And you're, it's you're, my you're, out, of, you're out of order. And you're out of order. And you're out of time. In, 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 in conclusion, the people are hurting and we need you. Okay, thank you. Fine. That's it. End it. That's it. We have one. Uh, I was advised we have one more speaker, Al Annunziata. My name is Albert Annunziata, I'm Executive Director of the Building and Realty Institute and the Apartment Owners Advisory Council. Well, the, uh, the statesman-like tone that uh, was established by uh, most of the speakers tonight, and I think culminated with uh, uh, Carmelo Emilio's um, acknowledgement that there are two sides of the equation and that 
uh, and that there should be a, a fair guideline all around reaching out to the other side and with a, with a proposal for four and six and a minimum uh, lowering guideline. Unfortunately, the proceedings tonight were uh, poisoned towards the end with a lot of uh, uh, rancorous accusations and uh, unfounded uh, uh, accusations, and, and uh, it, had, it has really spoiled what was a good give and take between uh, our colleagues, on, uh, most of our colleagues from the other side, and, uh, and the owners. Uh, I'm a Mount Vernon native, and um, I know the city quite well. I lived in the city for many years. Uh, Mount Vernon uh, is uh, a great city, was a great city, is a great city. Mount Vernon has a lot of problems. Yonkers has a lot of problems. The state, the country, Lord knows. And, you know, one has to, has to acknowledge those problems, but also look at this closed system of regulation. It's a closed system in the sense that it is specific to Westchester County, Nassau, Rockland, and New York City. It doesn't apply to anywhere else in the state and anywhere else in the country. So we've got to look at this, this symbiotic relationship that's often adversarial, unfortunately, but uh, we've got to look at this system, look at the pros and cons, look at the pros that the tenants get in terms of all the programs and, and, and the incentives that are available. Look at what the uh, what the incentives and, and, and uh, available through the law that the owners get, and you got to kind of balance all out and say, look, uh, you know, we're not going to solve, unfortunately, the employment problem. Uh, employment, uh, you know, you saw employment had been up for a good these good many years. Uh, um, uh, employment had been down. Uh, unemployment had been up these uh, these uh, good many years. Now employment is is down to about six percent. Again, it's overall. It, it doesn't address the pain in any particular community or neighborhood or whatever. So um, I ask that, that you put aside, you know, the accusations that, for instance, uh, someone representing an oil company who knows the energy field uh, did indeed volunteer uh, with no strings attached to give uh, the, the information, the best information that he could on his particular database. And he, made, he went out of his way to say that it doesn't include all customers, doesn't include the whole energy world, but the, the customers in his particular database. So these accusations of, uh, you know, vague and, and, and hostile, they really do nothing to, towards uh, some kind of reasonable uh, conclusion as to what constitutes a fair guideline. So I asked my Mount Vernon colleagues, as someone who grew up, in a small apartment on 201 West Lincoln Avenue, Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. And none of you is old enough to remember the roller skating rink. I grew up across the old roller skating rink on West Lincoln yes. Avenue, Mount Vernon. So anyway, I do ask the board to consider, uh, you know, the testimony and goodwill that was given by most of the people here on both sides mm -hmm. and, and hopefully come to a, to a, a right and just and fair uh, guideline. Thank you. Thank you. I have to give a gavel after all. <laughs> uh, I think this wraps it up. Before I ask for a motion to adjourn, I just want to remind everybody that next Monday in this room we will be having the presentations by the owner, members of the board, and the tenant members of the board. They each get 20 minutes to divide up as they like. Uh, I hope you can make it. And uh, the following Monday, we'll have rebuttals, which will be shorter, and discussion by the board, and the, uh, the vote on the guidelines. So that being said, let me thank you all for coming uh, and speaking. We listened to what you said. We're going to look at the uh, handouts carefully and review everything. Thank you, board members. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Well, motion uh, to Monday. by Carolyn Cope. And who is second? Ken. Eddie May Barnes. Mm. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? We're adjourned. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.